Hi, I'm Scott Farrell. I'm the Associate Pastor at Warrington Bible Fellowship, and today it is my joy and privilege to meditate with you on the third chapter of Esther. Esther is all about Haman's plot to destroy the Jews, and so today as we consider this evil and terrible plan of his, we're going to ask ourselves, how big is our God? Is our God really big enough to take care of of all of the evil that's in this world. But before we go into Esther chapter 3, Wayne Johnson is going to share with us from Revelation 19, which has to do very much so with our message today. Today in Esther 3, we're going to see a terrible plot conjured up by an evil man to destroy God's people. But our hope rests in the fact that our God will one day return to defeat evil once for all. From Revelation 19, starting verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has written a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be here. It's been a little while since I've had the privilege of meditating on God's Word with you, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here this morning uh, to do just that. So I want to invite you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3, and we're going to see Haman's plot. We're going to find out that Haman is a very evil man. We've already been in chapters 1 and 2 of Esther, of course, uh, back, I don't know when it was, a couple months ago, I think, uh, when we were last in Esther. Uh, and, And those two chapters introduced us to three of the most important people in our story, King Ahasuerus, and then two Jews, Mordecai, and of course, Esther, for whom the book is named. In chapter 1, we saw how the supposed sovereign rule of King Ahasuerus turns out to be paper thin as his wife, Queen Vashti, uh, disobeys his shameful request of her. And then he exposes his own weakness and shameful behavior by issuing a royal order that goes all throughout the huge Persian empire that Vashti will have her crown take away, taken away and he, she will never again be in the king's presence And oh, by the way, men are masters of their wives by law. And so King Ahasuerus' negative example teaches us in chapter 1 that by contrast, our truly sovereign God always has his way. And he never fails his people. We've sung about uh, the faithfulness of God this morning. Well, God never fails his people. But you know what? His decrees are also never evil. They are always holy and reflect His love and His care and His mercy for us and the fact that whatever God commands of us and requires of us is also very, very good for us. In chapter 2, we meet Mordecai and Esther, this beautiful young cousin of Mordecai. And Mordecai is the one who is raising his cousin uh, since her parents have died. But in chapter 2, she is taken away by the king's cohort to become a concubine in the harem of the king. And so Mordecai, uh, being the loving cousin that he is, checks in on her uh, every single day uh, as he goes in front of the harem's court and he asks about her. Now both Mordecai and Esther are like the rest of the Jews remaining in Persia. Some had gone back uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, years ago, but these are 
Jews who have stayed in Persia. They've become assimilated into the Persian culture. They have submitted themselves to the king and the laws of the land. Mordecai and Esther don't make any protest about Esther becoming the queen. In fact, Esther seems kind of excited about it, and so does Mordecai. And this is even as she becomes the wife of a pagan. And so in chapter 2, we see God's plan being put into place, preparing for circumstances we can't even see yet. Through people who aren't even truly faithful to him, people a lot like you and me. We learn that God is always at work in our lives in ways that we can't yet fathom, even as we make mistakes, even as we fail to the temptation uh, to go the world's way instead of God's way. God is faithful to his covenant people, even when we're not. And so today in chapter 3, we're confronted with supreme evil. The plan of Haman to destroy the Jews is going to remind us of Hitler's plot to do the same only 80 years ago. And the evil in chapter 3 is also going to ring true in some ways of our day and time. Although on a much smaller scale as Christ and his church are becoming more and more the enemies of the state because of our faithfulness to Christ and his word. And so today in chapter 3, we are confronted with true evil, pure evil. And in being confronted with this evil in chapter 3, we are going to hear in our culture some of the same sorts of echoes. Again, not nearly as serious as we find in chapter 3, but they can certainly be the precursor to what we find in chapter 3. And so as we realize these things, we've got to ask the same question that the Jews of Persia surely ask of God. How big is our God? Just how big is he? Is he truly sovereign over everything? Will he save the Jews from destruction? You know, there, there are some in our day who declare that the church is dying and that it's just gonna, it's just gonna snuff out like a candle. One day there will be no more church. Some people say this with a lot of happiness and glee. Other people say it with great sadness in their hearts. And so as we watch church attendance decline and the ways of God rejected more and more, is our God big enough to overcome evil in the world? Will God save his church? Will he really do it? Well, now we all know the Sunday school answer. Of course we do. Yes, yes, of course. God's going to save his church. But what are you going to think when that knock comes on your door? Or one day when your pastor might be penalized or arrested for what he says in the pulpit according to God's word? How are we going to be confident that God is as big as he says he is. Brothers and sisters, are we sure that God is going to save his church? Are we living in a way that proves that we're sure of that? Or do we live in fear of what's happening all around us to our country and to the fabric of of what is right and true? Or... Or do we face the evil of this world with the true hope and conviction that our God reigns supreme and that somehow he's using even our sufferings for his glory and for our good? Because brothers and sisters, our suffering will surely continue to grow as long as the world continues to turn more and more and more away from God to a degree that has not been seen since the days before the flood. When the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Well, we're going to meditate today on the answers to those questions in chapter 3 of Esther, which is about Haman's plot, an evil plan to rid Persia of every Jew and to plunder their wealth. 
And we see this plan first born of Haman's fury at an old enemy in verses 1 through 6. And then in verses 7 through 11, we're going to watch his fury turn into Haman's lie. For a man who harbors his anger will go to any lengths to destroy his enemy if he's allowed to. And finally, in verses 12 through 15, we're going to see that plot set into motion to exact Haman's revenge. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. That would, that would take too long. But allow me to read uh, some of the highlights for you so you have a really good idea of what's going on in case you haven't yet read Esther chapter 3. And if you haven't, I, I, I want you to go home and read that later this afternoon. You need to stare pure evil in the eyes. So beginning in verses 1 and 2. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were, with, who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then in verses 5 and 6, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews and the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And then finally, after King Ahasuerus has given Haman his permission to carry out his plan, Haman's edict is sent throughout the entire empire with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his word. So let's first take a look at Haman's fury in the first six verses. We've already been introduced to the easy, easily manipulated king in chapter 1 and to Esther and Mordecai in chapter 2. And so now in chapter 3, we meet the fourth and final major player in our story in verse 1. Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Now the king has promoted Haman to be his right-hand man, second only to the king. He's a very, very powerful man now. And the king orders everybody to bow to Haman and to recognize his great authority over him. But Mordecai, Mordecai doesn't bow. Now our first inclination is, is to think that the reason that Mordecai doesn't bow is because he's a Jew and refuses to bow before any man. And that's a noble thought, isn't it? But there's a deeper reason as to why he doesn't bow. You see, the Jews of Persia, including Mordecai, had already bowed to, the, to King Ahasuerus, and they had bowed to other kings too. In other words, they had submitted to them. So why is Mordecai not bowing to this guy Haman? Well, here's why. The reason he doesn't bow is because of a very bitter history between his ancestors and Haman's ancestors. This makes the Hatfields and McCoy feud sound like a picnic in the park. Because in chapter 2, Mordecai is introduced as the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. So as a descendant of the Benjaminite Kish, Mordecai shares lineage with Saul, the very first king of, of Israel who defeated the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15. And so Haman, in turn, is a descendant of the Amalekite king, Agog. Agog was simply a name for kings in, in Amalek. But this is the same king whom Saul and the Jews had defeated back in 1 Samuel 15. Now God had commanded, uh, he had condemned the Amalekites to extinction, extinction for their attack on the Jews when they had come out of Egypt and wandered in the wilderness. And so years later, uh, Saul uh, is being sent by God to carry out that sentence on the Amalekites. The destruction of the Amalekites. But Saul failed to carry out that 
those terms of the holy war, didn't he? He, God had commanded him to to do this, but he didn't do it. Instead, he spared uh, the the best of the animals and even, in essence, the best of the Amalekites, King Agog himself. And so for his act of disobedience, Saul is abandoned by God and rejected in 1 Samuel 28. But here in Esther, the consequences of Saul's sin rise up and they threaten the very existence of God's people all over again. And so Mordecai's refusal to bow is one of primarily ethnic pride because he simply is not going to bow down to a a descendant of the Amalekites. And Haman's fury is lit up for the very same reason. He's not about to respect Mordecai for his opinion of him. Out of ethnic pride, he hates Mordecai and all the Jews. He's returning Mordecai's racial, in essence, racial hatred, ethnic hatred in kind. But Haman has the upper hand, doesn't he? Because he has the means now to mete out his own vengeance upon the Jewish people. And that's exactly what he sets out to do. He sees an opportunity to do to the Jews what God had commanded Saul do to the Amalekites, to annihilate them. Now, we can see Haman's kind of hatred toward us in the church today, although, of course, not yet anyway, nearly as dangerous as that. Certain groups of people rail against us because in the past, Judeo-Christian values prevailed in our culture. But you know, as we look back, in one way, we can't say that we can blame them for, for being angry, considering the truly vile things that people calling themselves Christians have done to their fellow image bearers of God, acting out in evil in the name of holiness. That's purely shameful. And may it never be that we would be found guilty of such a thing. But as we're about to see in how Haman twists the truth, the truth is twisted in our culture when people reject the God of both love and justice. When people design a God in their own image rather than rightly bow down to the one true God. And so in their zeal against the church, They can't recognize that a true follower of Christ actually sees them as a fellow sinner, as as an equal in the sight of God, absolutely equal. We realize that all of us are in the same dire need for the mercy and the grace of our God. And so what we want for the lost is the best thing that could ever happen to them, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain, the author of our salvation, our great hope, forever both our Lord and our friend. That's what we want for everyone. But angry people, angry people, well, angry people turn to lies, just as the furious Haman now does in verses 7 through 11 as we begin to see Haman's lie as he makes the Jews out to be enemies of the state. So Haman turns to his Jewish problem in verses 7 through 11. That's how Hitler put it during the Holocaust. And by the way, there's a great lesson here in the danger of harboring anger. We're seeing what it turns into. It turns into bitterness, which turns into unadulterated wrath, which turns into violence. A man who holds on to his anger will do almost anything to destroy his enemy. And so the first step in carrying out Haman's vengeance upon the Jews is to figure out when the best time would be would be to to do this thing. And so the Persians determined things like this by casting poor or lots in verse 7. Now, the, the Jews also cast lots, but unlike the Persians, the Jews understood lots to be governed not by chance or by fate, but by God himself. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. 
And so we can certainly agree that this is the case here in the story of Esther. That, that the decision is from the Lord since the lot determines that the best time for Haman to carry out his murder is a good 11 months away. And that's a good thing. Praise God that Haman didn't uh, decide on his own when to murder the Jews because he'd have done it this afternoon or tomorrow morning at the latest. And so as we see this story develop in the coming chapters, we're going to see how God uses that time to finish setting everything into place to accomplish his will. And what is his will? It's to protect his covenant people. But even though Haman is the second most powerful in the empire, he's still got to get permission from number one, from King Ahasuerus. And so being the skilled politician he is, he knows he can't just walk up to this king and say, hey king, you know there's this guy over here who's really, who's really made me mad. Can I just go ahead and kill him and all of his people? He can't do that. And so what he does is embellish the story, so much so that it turns into a bald-faced lie, so that he can make the Jews appear to be enemies of the state in King Ahasuerus' eyes. And this is even though the Jews have been good citizens. And so in verse 8, he doesn't even mention the Jews by name, he just calls them a certain people. This is, this is his way of downplaying their significance to King Ahasuerus. This is sort of like our beginning a story by saying, you know, there is this guy. Who the guy is and what his name is and all those sorts of things doesn't matter to the story. What matters is what he does. And so this is what's going on here uh, in uh, Haman's downplaying the significance of the Jews. And so even though there are at least tens of thousands of Jews, if not hundreds of thousands, still living in Persia, Haman describes them as inconsequential. But he claims that what they do is very consequential, very significant. That is to say, they disobey the king's laws. And this is a lie. This is a lie. Yes, the culture of the Jews, as Haman says, is different from the rest of the people, but every single one of the various people groups in Persia, a a nation, an empire that is very proud of its diversity, every single one of these people groups has their own set of belief systems and cultures, just like the Jews. And yet they all found a way to live under Persian rule. And so even though the Jews had had permission to go back to Jerusalem years ago, most of them didn't go because, well, they built really comfortable lives in Persia. This is something you can't do if you don't submit yourself to the governing authorities. If you're constantly at odds with the law, where are you going to be? You're either going to be in jail or in an empire like Persia, you're going to be dead. So... For Haman to claim that these certain people were not law-abiding citizens is a bald-faced lie. But lying about God's people is nothing new, isn't it? I mean, we, even Jesus was, was lied about and mocked and called a blasphemer many, many times, especially during the week leading up to his crucifixion. If Jesus was treated like this, then why does it surprise us when we're treated like that? Why does, that, why does that surprise us? I mean, we're accused of hatred because of our biblical stand on many issues. When our true motivation is to speak the truth in love. Why? So that people have the opportunity to turn to Christ. Don't you remember that this is exactly the way you were treated before you were a believer? Somebody came to you and spoke to you with loving conviction about your sin and about your need for a savior in fact our lord takes it even further when we're uh, dealing with those who want to persecute us in matthew 5 11 and 12 jesus says blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? 
So back to our passage, Haman goes on to sweeten the pot for the king, just in case King Ahasuerus is disinclined to agree with his plan. He basically says to him, if you will allow me to destroy this this certain people, this insignificant people, I will pay you 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business and that they may be put into the king's treasuries. In other words, King Ahasuerus, I'm going to make you really rich. Not to say that you're not already, but man, you are going to be really, really rich when I'm done. Now, if you were to promise somebody this amount of money, let me give you a picture of what that looks like. This is 10,000 talents is an unimaginable sum of silver. This is about half a year's tax revenue for the entire Persian Empire, which stretches from India all the way to Jerusalem. And so if you were to promise somebody a half a year's tax revenue for the United States, that amount, you would owe them $1.75 trillion dollars. How's that for a retirement package? That is a ton of money. Now, given the crazy sum that's offered here, some scholars believe uh, that this is an exaggeration on the part of the author of our story, uh, just to make a point. The author is clearly a Jew. He sympathizes with the Jew, and he might even be Mordecai. So after all, where in the world would even the second in charge of the Persian Empire get this kind of dough? I mean, how in the world is he going to get a hold of that? So either the narrator is exaggerating uh, to make a point, or Haman is estimating the worth of the plunder that he could gather in exterminating the Jews. But regardless, the point is very clear. Haman's hatred and the extent of his passionate rage against the Jews is extremely high, and he's willing to go to any lengths to get rid of his arch enemy, the Jews, because Haman is an evil man who has made the Jews an enemy of the state in the eyes of the king, and he's done so so that he can fulfill his personal vendetta. And as our culture embraces what Dr. Al Mohler, the president of the Southern Baptist Seminary, calls the moral revolution, it's inevitable that people are judging any religions that hold to absolute moral laws, judging us to be enemies of the state we as Christians are becoming so dangerous to society because we believe what the Bible says with its rejection of the moral revolution for instance recently a leader of Britain's Labour Party apologized for attending a church that believes in Christian morality in Canada, there's, a, there's a, a law that criminalizes speech that has to do with sexual orientation. The clear result of that law is that the Bible is now a criminalized form of hate speech if you preach it. And Christians who do can face criminal charges and go to jail. And I believe a, a few already have. Now, in the U.S., Christian schools that hold to biblical morality are accused of discrimination and threatened with criminal and civil charges. There's also a bill that's being considered in Congress that would attempt to force religious institutions to comply with the moral revolution. Institutions like this church. Now, of course, the reason for that is the moral revolution rejects God's definition of marriage and personhood, sexuality, and a whole lot more. And so if this becomes law, we're going to face the consequences when we don't comply. And I say that very carefully. There's no if for me. The lie that's being perpetrated today is that the Bible is a cesspool of hatred and discrimination and misogyny. And therefore those who abide by it are dangerous people who need to be controlled and even hated. Because we're so dangerous now, our our rights are going to become more and more restricted, brothers and sisters. We're going to be accused of disobeying the king's laws. This is just how it is. It's inevitable. We can see it coming. So how big is our God? 
How big is our God? Well, back to Haman and his plot. King Ahasuerus agrees with Haman's lie that this unnamed certain people, however insignificant, are somehow at the same time an incredibly significant grave threat to his sovereign rule. (laughs) There's a great irony here. And so in verses 10 and 11, the king gives Haman his authority to do whatever he thinks is best. Just go ahead and do whatever you need to do. And so we've seen Haman's fury. We've seen Haman's lie. And now it's time to take a look at Haman's revenge in verses 12 through 15. The only thing left for Haman to do is to write the edict in the king's name that will order the annihilation of all of the Jews. So he dictates his decree and his evil plan is sent throughout the entire empire. And it is sent in verse 13 with instruction to annihilate all all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Haman's edict is not just giving the people permission to kill the Jews. He's ordering them to kill the Jews. Imagine being ordered by our government to go out and kill a certain group of people because the president has decided that. May it never be. But Haman is ordering them to murder all of the Jews without exception. Show no mercy. And so even as we shake our heads at such an evil plan, we've got to pause here for a second. We've got to consider an uncomfortable truth. And that is that Haman's degree, decree sounds a lot like the order that God had given Saul against the Amalekites, Haman's ancestors. Listen, 1 Samuel 15, verses 1 through 3, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman and child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Wow. Wow. What do we do with that? How how can a just and loving God order the destruction of an entire people? How can He do that? This is a scary and complex question to answer, to say the least. And a whole lot more could be said about it than we have time for. But we need to understand this. The crux of the matter is is that as our Creator, God alone has the moral and absolute right to destroy those who oppose Him. We know that He is holy and that every decision that He makes is holy. And so His anger is a different kind of anger from Haman's fury, isn't it? It's a different kind. Hebrews 10 31 warns us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Those who disobey God will pay their own price for sin, since the wages of sin is what? Death. Romans 6.23. When Christ returns, God will rightly order another holy war. And this is when Christ will come to crush the serpent under his heel and he wages a victorious war against those who oppose him. Without his righteous victory over evil, brothers and sisters, think of this. Without that righteous victory over evil, you and I would have no hope at all because evil would exist forever. Our sin would exist forever. 
So a good God must not only be victorious over evil, but he must be ruthless to defeat it, to annihilate it. Because if he didn't, just as when Saul disobeyed the God, obeyed his God to destroy the Amalekites, evil will raise its ugly head once again to plague us, to persecute us, to drag us down, to defeat us, and we would have no hope at all. But at the same time that God is fully just in that way, 100% just, at the very same time, He is 100% loving. You see, because of in, 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 instead of annihilating all of us, which is what we all deserve, can I hear an amen? We all deserve to be annihilated because we were born evil people. But instead of annihilating us, God the Father poured out His wrath on Christ in our place. Isn't that remarkable? Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And we, we, we receive that grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God, yes, He is fully just, 100% just, just as He is fully loving, 100% loving. He guarantees our eternal hope in part by annihilating evil. Christ defeated death when he rose from the grave and in the end he will defeat evil once and for all and, he, and, and therefore he gives us life in him even though we deserve death. But you see, Paul, Saul didn't understand the importance of annihilating evil even when God commanded him to do so. He, so he disobeyed. And we've seen what happens. So here in Esther, we find Haman about to turn the tables on God's people. Haman and King Ahasuerus, in verse 15, as the chapter closes, are so pleased with this plan of destruction that they sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. I bet they were. I bet they were. So we've watched Haman's unbridled fury rise up and we've seen how that fury turns into Haman's lie so that he can mete out Haman's revenge. That's the way anger works. And this is the way that pride and vanity work. His hatred drives him to carry out his vengeance at any cost. And we see similar rumblings today toward the church, though not nearly as severe. But the Christ of the Bible is becoming the enemy of the state. Make no mistake about it. He's becoming the enemy of the state as much as he was to the Jewish leaders and to the Roman Empire. All to say, just as the Jews in Persia, we're in an alien land, aren't we? We're in an alien land and we are also surrounded by confusion and chaos. Of course we are. Because the enemies of God, people who are rejecting the God of the Bible, seem to have the upper hand just as Haman seemed to have the upper hand the day the Jews read that terrible edict. So how big is our God? How big is He? Is He able to overcome all of this? Will his church survive or become a sad footnote in the annals of history? Yeah, 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 you remember those people who believed all that nonsense? What is God doing by allowing all of these things to happen to us? It's really easy for us to be afraid at a time like this, just as I'm sure the Jews were very afraid of Haman's plan. They didn't know that God was going to save them. All they saw was that edict, and it was 11 months away. 
So surely we have a lot of reason to be concerned too because we see the direction of things. We know where things are going. So as we close, I want to spend just a few minutes here in Romans chapter 8. I want to turn your attention to that. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This is where the Holy Spirit will give us a better understanding of why God allows our sufferings. Romans 8 teaches us many things that we can leave for another day. But in verses 12 through 17, we learn that through the life given us by the Spirit of God, we are heirs with Christ. We are children of God. But there's one caveat. Provided that we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. In verse 18, the Holy Spirit through Paul declares that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In other words, which is more valuable to you, to be comfortable in this life but experience the eternal wrath of God, or to suffer for a little while and bask in the glory of God forever? Well, then Paul in verse 21 explains how all of creation is waiting to be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. True believers and even all of creation are groaning as we eagerly wait to be adopted as sons and for our bodies to be redeemed. This is what we call the already but not yet of our faith. There are things that have already happened Christ has already saved us on the cross and he's given us a hope that we look forward to that has not yet happened for what is to come through his death, burial, and resurrection. What is to come is that he'll come back for his church and we'll enter eternity with Jesus Christ. And here's why all this is so relevant to our situation today and to the situations that the Jews found themselves in. And why that they and we could find hope that God would save them somehow. For the Jews, it was Haman's plan. For us, it's the absolute rejection of God that is coming by this world. So ours is not a shallow hope based on vapor. You and I could could hope for a raise but never get one, right? Right? You and I could hope that the Nats are going to win the World Series for the next three years, but we're most likely to be disappointed over and over again, aren't we? But our hope, our hope, our hope, our very real and certain hope is born of the reality of the cross, born of the reality of an empty tomb. And so our hope points to the cross. Yes, since the work of salvation is already done, but but our hope also points to the consummation of salvation that hasn't yet happened. So as Paul points out in verse 25, we hope for what we don't yet see, and yet we wait for it with patience. Why? Because the one who promises our salvation is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. And what is it that we're waiting for exactly? We're waiting for Christ to return in the very same way that Wayne read in Revelation 19 when Christ is mounted on a great white horse leading His holy army to defend all of the enemies of God once and for all. He will defeat them. There is no question. And so here we are in the not yet. Here we are in the meantime, right? The world is consumed by evil. It's falling apart. And so the question remains, do we know individually and collectively as God's church, as the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, do we know that God is big enough to overcome all of this? Amen, yes. (laughs) And the context Uh, This is the context for a verse that we're very familiar with. Verse 28 of Romans 8. And we know that for those who love God, help me, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Yes, even, even in the evil that we see happening all around us, God is at work. 
But it doesn't end there. There's more. There's more. What work is God doing? What is He doing? He's conforming you and me to the image of His Son in verse 29. And He's conforming us into His image by causing us to share in the sufferings of Christ. Romans 8.18, remember this, memorize this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That is worth repeating over and over again. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be like Christ unless we as individuals and the body of Christ, the true church of Christ, are willing and ready to suffer for him. God is going to use our coming sufferings not only to bring glory to himself but also to conform us, the body of Christ, the church, into the image of our Lord. And who is the Lord but the Holy One? The Holy One. And so we will get to spend eternity with him in a place where there is no evil. There are no plots by Haman but only the glory of of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So how big is our God? He is huge. He towers over all things, and He is able. Nothing, nothing, nothing is going to stop Him or His church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank You and we praise You that You are big. We thank You, Father, for the hope that you have given us in the gift of your Son. We thank you for the hope of eternal life, that one day we will be completely comfortable, that there will be no hardship or sin or evil, but only you. And we will get to enjoy you forever. But Lord, our enjoyment of you begins right now because even now we can rejoice when we're persecuted. We can rejoice in our sufferings because Christ suffered for us and because we are becoming like the image of Christ. Hallelujah and amen.